join me in prayer thanksgiving gracious loving giving and eternal heavenly father we bless you in many ways you made your presence felt in each of our lives and just as we heard a few minutes ago in our sermon the uh, promises you made to abraham and to isaac and to jacob the promise of land the promise of seed the promise of hope the promise of opportunity the promise of challenge the promise of reunion and the promise of celebration you made those same promises to each of us today we pray for each family represented here we pray for those who may be sick or be nursing sick ones we pray for your presence in each of those situations pray for our members who are traveling and pray for a safe travels for each of those and a safe return in the appropriate time we pray for the president of the United States. We pray for each member of Congress. We pray for the members of the judiciary and all those in positions of responsibility and authority over us. And just as we ask for your plan and your presence each of our lives, we ask that same blessing for those. Be with us as we go through our study this morning and, and, and indeed this day. Uh, enlighten us, fill us with your spirit, and forgive us of many sins. We ask in Jesus' name, Amen. So, Heather, mm -hmm. such a distinctive woman of great authority and presence to talk about you. You mentioned a little bit of your biography. I had known Heather, so when Heather came to our podium, I asked for her biography, and it was extraordinarily sterling. And I said, I wish I could be photographed with a woman like that. I'll take that back, put it on the wall, and say so. So to speak. But, uh, David, I look at Mark. My shirt here today. Um, I'm just going to take a few moments of privilege because we brought up our dear friend Pat. But you know, when I was uh, interim CEO at Pines, I was there during COVID. And as you all may recall, the Pines had very strict quarantine rules. Um, but, you know, I drive in to work um, and, you know, there's the big circle. And so I be driving in some 38 o'clock in the morning. And one time I was going down uh, Avenger Lane and I see somebody coming up past the barrier cage with a little beagle and I was like Pat but <laughs> you naughty girl and but I drove by and around and then a couple weeks later I you know I didn't tell on her but a couple weeks later I saw her and I said Pat um you remember like we have quarantine rules and y'all know how feisty she is. She was explaining to me that her law needed more exercise than could be had doing that one circle. I said, all right, I'm just going to let this slide because I just want to get into it with Pat. Um, so we love her. And then Sam Maloney, last time I saw Sam, I was doing the same thing. I was over at the Pines uh, delivering communion. And he was in there on his computer doing like 3D Wordle. <laughs> yeah, I don't do Wordle, but apparently it's a thing and it's, it's actually pretty difficult. But he had a special kind of Wordle that you did in 3D. So. And it was in Hebrew, too. <laughs> <laughs> Probably in Hebrew as well. well. Which is a great segue because we are in... Uh, the Hebrew Bible today, and we're going to talk a bit about one of the minor prophets, um, which I have to admit has been pretty minor in my, my education, and I can't say that I've ever taught on our friend Zechariah, so this is a uh, you know, fun time for me to dig into this text a little bit more. Um, just as some background, um, one of the minor prophets, 12 minor prophets, um, there's not a whole lot to be known about this prophet Zechariah outside of the text itself. Um, there's many scholars think that he was of the priestly class um, and wrote in that post-exilic era 
So as we often talk about in you know the history of the the Hebrew Bible, that that date 587, 587, 586 is so important because that's when the exile occurred. So our our setting, so to speak, now is after um, the exiles who chose to have returned to Judah and there's the process of rebuilding trying to rebuild the temple that had been destroyed um, by the Babylonian invaders um, one of the questions I actually have of this text which I couldn't find an answer to is was Zechariah part of that exilic group had he been part of that elite that had been sent into ba into Babylon. Because as we get further into this text, there are some themes that I think are interesting when you think about how the literature of the Hebrew Bible had evolved after that 587, because many of these elite Hebrews that were in exile became part, they became somewhat assimilated into the culture. And they picked up on a lot of the literary and uh, theological themes that they saw in Babylon. So we don't know if he was part of that group, but there are some interesting things to ponder in that. Um, another element about the book of Zechariah is uh, it's kind of like two, two, two books in one. Um, like the prophet Isaiah, you know, the book of Isaiah, we have a first Isaiah, second Isaiah, third Isaiah, fourth Isaiah. Um, scholars tend to uh, divide this book into two parts. And the first part, many do attribute to a prophet, Isaiah, who was likely writing at about 520 um, in Judah. But then there is a second part of this, and that this is where our text for today is situated, is in that second part um, that begins in chapter nine. And scholars think that um, the second part was likely written by other some other people um, that were part of a school of Zechariah. And we've talked about that before, how prophets tended to attract followers and then they would carry on and write under the name of that prophet, you know, because authorship back then wasn't as strictly confined as we would do it today. So we're in this second part of the book of Zechariah. And chapter nine actually begins, you can kind of tell there's a pretty clear, distinctive break when beginning, if you have your Bibles, you can see beginning of chapter nine just says an oracle. So that uh, tells us we're going into a different type of literature here. Um, and so that's where we're going to start. And I'm going to go ahead and read our text. It's a little bit long, but I think it's worthwhile. To, and I want you to kind of per keep your ears perked to some of the symbolism, um, the themes that you're hearing. And we'll, and your lesson talks about one of the symbols, and we'll, we'll talk about this after I go ahead and read the, the text. Uh, this is uh, chapter 9, beginning in verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he. Humble and riding on a donkey. On a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, 
because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double, for I have bent Judah as my bow. I have made Ephraim its arrow. I will arouse your sons, O Zion, against your, against your sons, O Greece, and wield you like a warrior's sword. Then the Lord will appear over them, and the arrow go forth like lightning. The Lord God will sound the trumpet and march forth into the whirlwinds of the south. The Lord of hosts will protect them, and they shall devour and tread down the slingers. They shall drink their blood like wine and be full like a bowl, drenched like the corners of the altar. On that day, the Lord their God will save them, for they are the flock of people, or like the jewels of a crown, they shall shine on the land. For what goodness and beauty are God's? Grain shall make the young men flourish, and new wine the young women. So the young women get the new wine. That's a better deal than the, the grain, I <laughs> So. Is this the only time in the Bible when the word slither appears? I, th that's a good question. I don't know. And I did not do my Hebrew word study there. So I can't tell you. Um, one of the tools that biblical scholars use are, is something called a concordance. And so I have this thing, it's a Strong's Concordance, and it's this big old book. And what you can do is you find an English word, and you can go in, look that up, and it'll tell you where that word appears across you know, the biblical text and give you kind of the Hebrew or Greek derivations of it. So if you ever are interested in doing a word study, you can go up to our library and check out the concordance and... Go for it. But the answer to your question is, I don't know. What is slender in? Huh? Slender, was it? Slender. Uh, slender. Slender. Oh, slender. Oh. Slender. Oh. Slender. Oh. Slender. Oh. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, a swinger. Swinger. But a swinger. <laughs> <laughs> swinger. <laughs> swinger. <laughs> oh. Any other, we'll, we'll just open it up. Any other observations, things that stuck, stuck out to you in this text? That are of interest. I never. I, I call the distinction. I never knew the distinction between the donkey and the horse. Yeah. The use, the purpose of one animal and one type of transportation of movement or life and the war, the war horse, and the and the reference to the war horse. Right. And in our lesson today, the author spends a good bit of time talking about that distinction. Um, and I guess in, in some ways, uh, burnishing the reputation of the donkey, um, as the donkey has some, the mule or donkey has sometimes been a little bit denigrated as the lesser of, because of supposed characteristics of their, their demeanor, their stubbornness, but, you know, on the flip side, what you know the symbolism and the imagery of the donkey is it it's a peaceful animal it's an animal that bears burdens that is a working animal and on you know by contrast that war horse bit of a show pony has one purpose to bring about division and war so so the imagery that the author here is using kind of there's that contrast between those two animals. Yeah. They mentioned the lesson writer mentions that Solomon uh, rode a donkey in some kind of, I guess, parade. You know anything about? I, I, I'm just seeing a thing that I never knew. I thought the donkey and Jesus just was saying, you know, this is. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a bright oh, king, I'm a, a, a the humble king. servant. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, as Christians, 
when, you know, we read New Testament texts, particularly the Gospels, we will often, you know, much of it is the fulfillment of Scripture, right? So when we read in the New Testament of Jesus coming into Jerusalem on the donkey, that's a fulfillment of the Hebrew text and that promise. And, and so there's a parallelism that happens um, that the writers of the New Testament text, I think, were, were very conscious of that and deliberately made those connections because their hearers would then say, oh, okay, you know, this is the, this is what the scripture had foretold. This is, you know, the Messiah, because we know from, particularly <laughs> they were themselves of the Hebrew tradition, they would make those connections pretty quickly. So, any other images and so we said we talked about donkey a little bit so one thought yeah or someone over there yeah you're good mark <laughs> i'm trying to find um new newer prophecies about jesus in the old testament by using the word save mm -hmm. in the in the english <clears throat> which is in Hebrew is the name of Jesus, Yeshua. Mm -hmm. And that is used in this uh, verse. I, they're not all like prophecies. You, it, right. you know, sometimes you have, sometimes they're very obvious. And I would say this is not so obvious. <laughs> but it says, uh, on that day in verse 16, uh, Yahweh, their God, will Yeshua save in the English, mm -hmm. them for they are a flock of his people, like the jewels of a crown, and they shall shine on his land. I don't know if, if in your experience and knowledge, what that is, is has that anything to do with the Messiah, or is that just an extrapolation? Uh, that's a good question. I think, you know, a reader depends on where the reader is situated. Right? You know, like if I were hearing that in that context in 520, whenever it was written, I would not be reading into that from my own perspective, you know, as situated as a 21st century Christian. So interpretation always depends on where you're situated, you know, historically and socioculturally. So, well, and anecdotally, Gordon is. It's used 22 times in the Old Testament. Sling. Slinger. Sling. Sling. Slinger. It means leaf in one of the 22, but anyway. Yeah. Mark's got his, you got your concordance with you, or you just know that? <laughs> no, I don't happen to know that. Okay. <laughs> that's not the, not the word I, I've been uh, memorizing <laughs> over the years, but I, I do have a quick accent. Very good. Well, I think it's important that we realize we're reading this in the lens right. of the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And I think that's our, I think that's important for us to not forget. Yeah, and that's the point, you know, when I'm in interfaith dialogues with particularly our Jewish siblings, um, Christians have a tendency to engage in something called supersessionism, which is to impose upon the Hebrew text a lot of the stuff that we as Christians believe, right? And we have to be careful of that um, because we have, and I, this, I'm going to use my favorite word, hermeneutical lens. We have particular her hermeneutical lenses, which means a hermeneutics is pretty much the art and science of interpreting a text. Um, and everybody comes to a text with their own experiences, with their own understandings from their traditions. And even the best of us who really try hard to kind of put that in the background, do it. And the best thing we can do is be honest about it. Say, you know, I have been culturally um, taught to view a text this way and I'm working not to do it. But 
so yeah, so the the hearers, the readers, you know, back in the day when this was written, likely had a very different understanding of the meaning um, of it. Yes, Carol. I was thinking about how things happen that seem insignificant, but become so significant. The fact that Zechariah talked about the donkey. I mean, you'd think, oh, well, <laughs> what's the significance of that? And yet it's a great faith building uh, kind of statement for those of us who come afterwards and look back on the entrance into Jerusalem. And we see it as a powerful fulfillment of prophecy. Mm -hmm. And yet it, it's, you would think it was so insignificant had you lived before that time. Right. Um, yeah. So any other <clears throat> observations, just kind of on language, themes? Uh, in, yeah. In my study Bible, there was a cross-reference uh, referring to the messianic uh, value of this. And it refers to uh, Jesus' words to the disciples that he was walking with on, on the road to Emmaus. It's from uh, Luke 24, verses 24 to 27. May I read it? Yeah, absolutely. Then he said to them, oh, how foolish you are. And how slow to hear, to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in the scriptures. So a, a direct reference to at least this one prophet, and there are some other references to that Jesus referred to in other states. Yeah, yeah. And I I did find an article that talked about the in like what would the influences on Zechariah be? And one of the, the articles I read said that um Zechariah was probably and the school of Zechariah seems to have been influenced by Ezekiel, an earlier prophet. So you have these lineages of influence. Um, liter literarily um, and also theologically across the span of these writings too. And then, as you said, that carries forward into New Testament slash Christian writings as well. Um, one of the themes that really isn't explicit in this particular text is and we kind of talked about it as I set the stage is that the centrality, the importance of rebuilding this temple. Um, as I said, Zechariah was likely out of that priestly class, so they were more of the elites um, who had a vested interest in the reconstruction, not just of, of the temple itself as an edifice but the underlying theological and sociocultural life of the returned exiles. So when we read this, you know, these, the, these promises that the writer is saying, that the writer is telling us that, you know, when you, when the Lord will appear over them and the arrow go forth like lightning, the Lord God will sound the trumpet and march forward with the whirlwind of sound. The Lord of hosts will protect them. So these are promises that if, uh, you know, follow, if we are faithful to Yahweh, then we will be protected. The fulfillment of, of these hopes of peace will come to pass. And for, for these folks that are, working to restore their religious community and the physical space, that would have been encouraging to hear and motivating to hear as well. Um, and also helping this process, if you'll remember, 
Um, do you, you remember the, who was the person who, uh, remember the Babylonians who took everybody into exile? What happened to them? Yeah, the, the exiles did, but what happened to the Babylonian Empire? Was it the Assyrians that took them all? Cyrus. Yes, the Persians. The Persians. Right. So the Persians defeated the Babylonians, and we have the very beginning of the book of Zechariah, we're told that this is happening during that, that Persian rule. And one thing that's distinctive, pretty distinctive about the Persians, like Darius and Cyrus, is they encouraged their vassal states, their client states, to have religious autonomy. And we know that the Persian government of the time, Cyrus King, actually gave money to help rebuild the temple. Um, so that's pretty significant where you have this empire that probably not out of necessarily just the goodness of their hearts, but some pretty real politic understanding of how you can create a client state that's stable and not does not have animosity towards its overlords. So there was no anything about the role of the priests during the exile because so much of what the priests did was related to the temple. Right. So I'm just wondering, did, <laughs> do we know anything about if the priests still held position in the exile? Um, I think they did. Because when you look at diaspora Judaism, you know, the history, and by that I mean Jews that do not live in Israel. Um, the history of diaspora Judaism actually starts really with that Babylonian exile. So you had a community um, that very likely was still being led by its elite. You know, you had the elites in exile, but then you had the elites of the elites who were the priests. And another thing is the output of literary, you know, stuff that started coming out during that exile in the post-exilic era is really significant. For example, one of the, the creation stories in Genesis is likely to have been written during that exilic period and a little bit thereafter. So I think you had a pretty vibrant, um, engaged and productive priestly class operating outside of the temple, which created almost a template for diaspora Judaism and how it would operate um, from that point forward. I mean, that's just my supposition. I haven't read anything definitive on it, but something to think about. Any other thoughts? One thing that when I read this is interesting because it's a clue to maybe a dating question of when this was written. So if you go down, I mean, to verse 13, for I have bent Judah as my bow. I have made Ephraim as its arrow. I will arouse your sons of Zion against your sons of Greece. Why is Greece in there? What does that suggest in terms of the dating of a the writing of a text? The Hellenistic Empire. So it was in Alexander. Right. So a little clue, perhaps, that this particular section was written later after Greece became power. Um, that's just a tidbit when you're looking at these texts, how you can kind of find little clues when things might have happened. Um, Heather, I, I looked in, uh, I like to look in my Bible dictionary when I don't know much about the character. I'm looking for something about Zechariah other than 
maybe uh, the, the name. They, had, they said two things, and I don't know where all of this comes from. They said it was written, the book was written over two years. Very quick time for uh, a book like that. And uh, the, what was the other thing? I forgot that. But, um, oh, that the book of Zechariah is, mentions Messianic prophecies more than any other minor prophet. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was interesting because we, we hang a lot on Isaiah. Yeah, we do. And uh, and this, some of this was pretty direct. Yeah. One of the, the Jewish scholars that I uh, looked up kind of ties into your comment there that they, they uh, categorize particularly the chapters 9 through 14 as uh, apocalyptic literature. Um, and they, they go on to say, although not as fully developed as the apocalyptic visions described in the book of Daniel, the oracles, and we're in that particular space, the oracles, as they are titled in Zechariah, contain apocalyptic elements. One theme these oracles contain are descriptions of the day of the Lord, when the Lord will go forth and fight against these nations as when he fights on the day of battle. So we've just seen that these nations like Greece and and you know Ephraim and and that Zion will prevail over this. And remember that the term apocalyptic in our culture has gotten kind of a weird name. It doesn't mean the rapture, and it means more of a revealing. So so this is a type at least according to this scholar, a type of apocalyptic revealing literature that foretells um, that Yahweh will, will prevail. And but as you were saying, that foretells, you know, that, that messianic hope, too, when we read it from our particular lens looking backward. So in Tom's comment, Van Leer took us a couple of weeks to go through Isaiah, and that it almost, I would almost suggest that there was apocalyptic to think about the new Jerusalem yeah. and the new yeah. heaven and the earth at that time. And we had to spend a lot of time on that the past couple of weeks. So thank you for bringing that forward, Tom. Yeah. That's a good point. Any other observations, Bill? These things. Um, I always thought that. Uh, John the Baptist's father's name was, and I always thought there was a link there somewhere. Never read anything, but that he named Zachariah for a reason, due to the fact that this minor prophet wasn't so minor in the hearts of my son. Yeah. And the other thing is that I'm reminded of those 16 in that declaration that on that day the Lord their God would save them. I'm reminded of the confusion some folks have with John Calvin, the word predestination, and that we, we assume it means one thing. I think what Calvin meant was that God is predisposed towards salvation. And all throughout scripture, we realize that God is not only the creator, but the, but the savior of creation. Mm -hmm. We should not be surprised if this crops up here. And it crops up there, and, and thus Christ is the Savior, comes to make sure that nothing is lost. Yeah. But my point is that Calvin is misunderstood when what Calvin was saying is that this God is the God who is predisposed at the end of the day towards salvation. Somewhere in that mix, I guess there is some condemnation, but I think first on the list is salvation. Yeah. yeah. Well, does that, does that say salvation is not absolute then? It's an opportunity? Well, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the first order. Just, oh, oh, boy. Now <laughs> <laughs> we're rolling. Who would you guys start? I know. All, I, all I remember is my, I remember my tulip. Y'all know what tulip is? Tulip. First, total depravity. Was it unlimited grace? And so it's it's limited kind of a limited atonement. 
it's uh you know you're at least at Princeton it's theology 101 and 102 literally are just reading Calvin's Institutes that's all we did at least back then so I just can't even <laughs> but but yeah so Jane Jane has a point no, I, I have I have I have a note of humor as it was starting to get very, very thick because there's still plenty of time for you to take this back on the rails. But even as you started this and talking about the minor prophets, some will remember another um member of um DCPC um longtime professor, um Dr. Max Polly, um otherwise known as Max the Axe. Um, when it came to grading. And, and this foolish young student decided to take an upper level religion course from Max the Axe. And as we were preparing for our first test, and I was in there with a bunch of religion majors and people who knew what they were doing. And he did this you know, very Max Polly kind of um, description of, you know, how it, he had experienced it. And he said that there was this student who, when it came into the exam, that had been convinced that the professor would not be so obvious as to have made the, the exam about the major kings. So he had spent all of his time studying the minor prophets. And then he got in there and it was asking a question about the major kings. And so he started out the line of saying, far be it from me, a humble student of the Bible to do this. But on the minor prophets, <laughs> and then Max just kind of said, and he still failed. <laughs> that was to try to call his notes. Every time I hear the distinction between minor prophets and no, oh, let's go back to Isaiah, I'm like, oh. <laughs> oh well, but anyways, sorry. I just you know, Calvin was an interpreter of biblical texts, and I have in my home, courtesy of John Kirkendall, an 1856 version of Calvin's commentaries that line the top <laughs> shelf of our library, and he was a meticulous interpreter. Um, and every now and then I'll pull one of those volumes down just to kind of get a sense of what he was seeing and kind of compare and contrast that with more contemporary interpreters or whatever. Um, but I think it goes to the point again of situating ourselves in our socio-political historical context text as interpreters that we bring certain things to the text. Um, as the text speaks to us too. Another, you know, since we're using big words today, um, along with apocalyptic, there's an eschatological, strong eschatological element to this text. And that means looking to an end time. Um, again, not really like in the, what's that, that thing? The guy who wrote all those rapture books? Right. Second Calvinism, yeah, not really like that, but but there's kind of this eschatological, looking forward kind of thing. So you combine that in these texts um, to see what what that promises, what Yahweh's promises are to Zion um, going forward. Um, moving into our contemporary context, when you read this particular text from Zechariah, how does it speak to you? And what are some ways do you think it can strengthen your faith? Maybe change a little bit of, of how you view, you know, your relationship with God and other people? Any reflections on how you can take this text? and apply it within your day-to-day -day life. Gordon, you're you're forming something over there. <laughs> it takes a while for things to form. <laughs> I'm just looking at, I'm remembering, I don't have the book in front of me, the title of this lesson has to do with peace for all people. So we haven't really explored that very much in our discussion here. 
Peace for all people. Me? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's an idealistic, I think, element to this. We see a picture being painted of what Yahweh brings, and that donkey image fits into that, too. Um, that the ruler, the Lord of Zion, is not riding on the war horse, is not a militarist, even though the language in here, to me, comes across as militaristic. I think it, it's in there as kind of a contrast that um, the Yahweh of Zechariah is telling is not that military political leader that maybe they knew of when they were in Babylon. Maybe that's where kind of the contrast emerged that you know, we were invaded. We were, we had our temple completely destroyed by this militaristic uh, empire. We were taken away, but now we're back. Um, and Yahweh's different. You know, Yahweh is riding on the donkey. Yahweh brings peace, but there's still this element of warning to these other nations. Kind of like, don't mess with us. Because you know, we there's a strength in that piece as well. That's kind of my take on it, Gordon. Anybody I else? take real I I take real hope in from verses 14 down to through 15, because you can see the Lord is watching over. Yeah. He's he the Lord appears over them. His arrow, not our arrows, but his arrow will go forth. The Lord will sound the trumpet. He will march forth. He will protect us. Those words comfort me. When you look at war on the surface, you see generals and soldiers. Right. But to know that God is overseeing it gives me great comfort. That presence of omnipresence of God. Yeah. I was more struck reading carefully one of the verses about um, the donkey was brought up earlier. It had his first words. That's uh, nine, is it? Mm -hmm. Let's see. Yes, nine. Rejoice. Now, this is my interpretation, if you don't mind. Good morning. Rejoice greatly, all daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your maluf, your king, is coming to you. He is righteous. He is Yeshua or Yasha, the form of, of the etymology of Yeshua. Basically, he's saying is Jesus who is righteous, humble, and mounted on a donkey, even as a colt, the foil of a donkey. I uh, think it's a coincidence that the Hebrew happens to use uh, uh, the, the name of the Hebrew name of. Jesus, yes. Yeshua, or Yasha, because one's a verb form and one's a common noun form. In the Old Testament, it appears 347 times. Well, that I didn't know, because that's one of my uh, obsessions, okay. along with the seven mentions of, of Yahweh in this, just this chapter, seven. Yeah, yeah. So, it's, it, to me, it's, you say, well, how, how does that affect your life? It affects my faith. I think uh, I think it was mentioned earlier by Carolyn that it affects our faith. Wow, I mean, it, it, here's a donkey. Talk of someone who's sata, or righteous, and his name is Jesus. Really? Yeah. That seems extremely serendipitous right. in terms of looking, like you said, Dr. Presley about the, looking through lenses of thousands of years ago versus our lenses today. Uh, that's that eyesight you can see. The older I get, the more. Uh, uh, it was this one who still made that comment. Oh, I, I wonder if I would have said that. that. <laughs> but it was good. <laughs> Here, my spectacle. You didn't see any good at all. Dr. Gus. Right. <laughs> uh, good point. And 
thanks for kind of rereading that because you know the the multiple it's on a donkey on a colt on a foal of the donkey that repetition mm -hmm. says we want i want you to really understand this right this is here it is don't be fooled it's not some sort of war horse in um, talking about peace and in saying this i raise more questions than i I could ever answer. But recently, leaders from Africa went to try to get peace in Ukraine. Okay. And I thought, what an important message. We feel good because we're given weapons. They're coming in and saying, is there a way we can help to bring peace? And I'm not saying who... <laughs> that we we're wrong or anything. It's very complicated. Yeah. But there was a strong message from uh -huh. them because they probably don't have the money to buy weapons. We do. So we do <laughs> what we do, and they're doing what they can do. And the mission was not successful as we see it now. Right. We don't know down the road if it's if it might have influence. Yeah. And, you know, some of you may know that the PCUSA has, throughout its history, been engaged in different peacemaking types of ministries. And, you know, there's actually a group that I'm part of on PCUSA, you know, peacemaking. So I get newsletters from them and stuff. Uh, and I don't know why, but you you just made me think that there's a movie coming out this summer called Oppenheimer. Oh, yeah. And you all may know the story of Robert Oppenheimer, who was a brilliant physicist who was employed by the U.S. government to create the atomic bomb. Um, when I was at Princeton, one of the great privileges that I had there was to serve as kind of the Girl Friday for Ambassador George F. Kennan. And George Kennan's career was as a diplomat, and he was the ambassador to the Soviet Union in the 50s, the ambassador to Yugoslavia. Um, but he also wrote something called the X article. And the X article went against much of the prevailing thought in Washington at the time, which was we as the United States needed to be aggressive against communism, communist menace that was encroaching across Europe. And Kennan's thesis in this X article was like, no, we don't. And if we kind of take a step back, communism cannot sustain itself, that eventually it will implode. Now, I got to sit in his kitchen when the Berlin Wall was coming down. Mm. And it's like, how do you say to a guy, you feel vindicated right now, don't you? I didn't say that. But anyway, so you have Oppenheimer, and Oppenheimer and Kennan were actually good friends. Um, Oppenheimer was the one who invited Kennan to join the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton. And Kennan did a lot of work with Oppenheimer on thinking about diplomatic means to promote a peaceful resistance to communism. So I'm looking forward to seeing the Oppenheimer movie, but, you know, it, it like you said, Carolyn, it's just so difficult um, to try to broker those agreements, um, but yet... You know, many folks continue to try. I think you could extrapolate from the movie The Fog of War that, that McNamara um, yeah. said. He basically says the same thing you can read between the lines. He said, We should not have gone into Vietnam because that domino theory wasn't on the whole. We should have just stepped back and watched it, as you said, just you know, come apart. Well, you know, Ho Chi Minh appealed to the U.S. government first against France. Yeah. yeah and said you know i have read your declaration of independence 
I have read your constitution. I admire you. This is what I want for us. And he was ignored. So unfortunate. So I have a question for you. Uh, since the subject is, a, is important point out is peace, how do we, is there anything we can extrapolate from this text, how we, we can apply it for peace now? I mean, you mentioned in our personal lives, which is wonderful, but the world is, as you know, is in great turmoil, uh, notwithstanding Ukraine, Russia, you know, the North, North Sudan and other places. So is there anything that you, you, that you see in here that help us understand, uh, let's say, a strategy toward engaging in peace in a well, conflicted area? Put it all on me, man. <laughs> You're the teacher. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I actually I have to know we're good. I, but I actually have some theories that really aren't evident in this particular text. But it's recognizing the common humanity. You know, we're all children of God. And what I see happen so often in conflict is dehumanization. Mm. And if I can other... Like, think about Rwanda, the Hutsis and the Tutsis. Tutus. Tutus. Tutus and Tutsis. Tutus, yeah. But, in, you know, in any genocidal situation, you have a group that is able to demonize, otherize uh, a minority, and then it just becomes a cascade of violence and all that. And, and so my question is always, at what point in time could that have been stopped? You know? And I st I've started uh, watching a, a documentary about Berlin in the 20s and 30s, like right before the rise of Nazism. And it was actually in the context of uh, LGBTQ issues, because Berlin in the 20s had a very vibrant um, gay community, and that gay community became one of the first targets of the Nazis. Um, there was a sexologist named Magnus Hirschfeld who was doing some of the earliest research on gender identity, sexual orientation, and was really like kind of at it from a scientific point of view. His um, library was destroyed. By the Nazis. So there was that targeting right there. They knew that we can otherize and demonize this minority group. And then it starts moving on, you know, Jews to, you know, stateless people. Gypsy, Gypsy yeah, the stateless people in Germany. Yes, so to me, the question is stopping it before it starts. And I fear we're in a place and time in America where we need to do some peacemaking ourselves within the confines of our own country. Yeah, Zachariah's reference to the prisoners of hope. Yeah, and then cool. is, that, is that a reference not only to the captives that got carted off to Babylon? Because they were prisoners of hope there. But that's also, I guess, to you know, use the term you used. That's an eschatological term yeah. for us today that we are prisoners. Of right. Hope. We do not lose that hope, which makes then peace a viable, uh, a, a, a viable product of, of what we do. Because if you live in hope, you want to create the environment for that hope to thrive. Right. Good friend of mine who's a constitutional law practitioner argued Bostock in front of the Supreme Court. He uh, has a quote that I love, and I don't know if it's original to him, because you know, if the cause is just, there is always hope. And we know that the cause of peace is always just, because God is righteous and God is just. And that, I think, is very clearly put forth in the Zechariah te text, that that's who Yahweh is, as Mark pointed out. So, as servants of God, we serve a just and righteous God. So, therefore, 
as prisoners of hope, we are always, you know, that that's our mission. That's a, the path of discipleship that we're called to walk within and upon. So. I think I see a lot of wringing of hands within the Christian community. Yeah. Which is unfortunate, but, but it's inappropriate behavior. Not to minimize the anxiety that we all feel. Right. But that's part of the faith that we're prisoners of hope. Right. Well, One more question. One more, okay. For you? Yes. Um, a lot of this chapter could be, and is likely metaphorical, maybe real and or metaphorical. Mm -hmm. As you point out, repetition in this medic poet, poetic style right. means emphasis. Okay. Like Jesus said, verily, you know, verily, not just once. Um, do you think that this is a spiritual, an admonition for us in our peacemaking, whether it's in our homes, our communities, country, or overseas? There must there should be more of a spiritual approach to peacemaking other than the traditional approaches, which are, as you point out, sending money for weapons. And the Africans did a wonderful, but that was a diplomacy. That was not a, I don't know, but my guess, it wasn't very spiritual. I mean, what if someone, here's my theory, what if someone went to Putin, for example, let's talk about the big elephant in, yeah. in the world at the moment, and sat and said, instead of talking about the elephant, let's talk about prayer and engagement and about your family. And, and he might think it's odd, but in my personal experience, I've seen the worst despots in the world melt with anyone interested in them. Yeah. I mean, other than what they can get from them or telling them what to do and how to behave. Yeah. And, and I think that kind of ties back to like a bit of what I said earlier about finding the humanity. Mm -hmm. You know, under that recognizing our common humanity. And I think I would suggest that all of our great religions, certainly the Abrahamic religions, say that humans in some way, shape, or form are children of God. Right. So from a spiritual perspective, that can be the basic starting point. And anecdotally, I, I remember reading about, you know, the when uh, was it Beg and then uh, oh my God, Sadat and Begin from Egypt. Yeah, when, when those talks were going on, that at Camp David, they managed to get to a discussion about what kind of world do you want for your kids or your grandkids. Oh, okay, there you go. And that kind of became that common ground upon which the discussion of how do we get there can occur. Would you, if, if Putin was sitting there, would you offer to pray with and for him in sure. country? Yeah. I wonder how many people, because he thinks he's on a religious mission. Right. He thinks that his uh, Russian Orthodox yeah. beliefs. So he believes in the Holy Spirit. He believes in God. Right. He says so in, in Jesus Yeshua. So what if I someone would, prayed with him? I wonder how that would if that had an impact on that. You know, it's interesting because I've had to do that with people who have demonized me. You know. Um you know, you there are there there are people like <laughs> well, but, but, but no, I mean, there are people, as we all know, who are vitriolically anti-LGBTQ, who think I'm the devil, who think I'm going to hell. And I've sat with people who have hold those beliefs, and we've had very, very intimate conversations, because what we were able to do is get at the root of why they hold those beliefs, and what has happened to them. And How did you get there? Just by asking questions. You weren't aggressive then. No. Recognizing the humanity of the person in front of me and that they come to these discussions with a life story, with um, uh, attitudes that were formed. Um, and, and you just let them talk. 
or that that's my approach. Next. Um, and I think that can in those one-on-one -on -one type relationships, um, that's where people's hearts and minds, I think, are best changed. Um, you can put out all the policy white papers you want, and that's important, and it should be done. Law is an important tool, but what really transforms people is that ability to sit with and to talk honestly about them, and then to come to come to an understanding of that common ground of humanity we all share. It goes back to your question a few moments ago, what do we take from that language, about that of Zachariah language? And, and so it was our comments for our class, I would say, those are universal questions. Yeah. And, and the answers haven't come yet. They haven't, we haven't solved it. And we'll ask those same questions tomorrow, the next day, the next day. On that note, I'm going to thank you all for being here this morning, and I'm going to close this in prayer. God of peace. God of all righteousness and justice, you come to us on a donkey, a foal of a horse, a colt. You bring to us the ability to have faith in your promises as we look backward and see the, the text that you've given to your people beforehand and as we look forward to the promises that are still ahead of us. We ask that you be, be with us this week as we seek to be instruments of your peace. Keep our minds and hearts open to others that we may hear with love and grace their experiences and let's also be reminded that we have opportunities as disciples of a living Christ to bring forth peace within our own communities and within our own families. We ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Good job.